joining us. Welcome everyone to our NEPCURE U today on improving diagnosis with biomarkers in kidney disease. My name is Kristen Hood and I'm NEPCURE's Director of Clinical Outreach and I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. Before I introduce Dr. Mariani, I would like everyone to know that we will be offering a question and answer session at the end. So feel free throughout the webinar you can enter your questions in that Zoom task bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, try to use the Q&A button if you can. Um, I know that there's a chat function too, so I will look at both, but definitely use a Q&A, please. Um, we'll answer as many questions as we can. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website as a patient resource under educational programs. And I'd like to recognize the NEFCURE sponsors who help make programs like this available to you. Um, our sponsors um, that help make these programs available are Trevere Therapeutics, Goldfinch Bio, Pfizer, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, Vertex, Boehringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals, and Natera. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lara, Lara Mariani from the University of Michigan. She's an adult nephrologist and assistant professor in nephrology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Dr. Mariani attended medical school at the University of Michigan uh, and did her residency and fellowship in nephrology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her areas of clinical and research focus are on glomerular disease and chronic kidney disease. And I'm so excited that she is here with us today because she's also been deeply involved with research around biomarkers. And I'm really looking forward to her teaching us today about the significance of these discoveries. I do have to say proudly, she's a great friend of NEFCURE and a highly respected nephrologist in our country. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Mariani. I'm gonna let you take it from here. Great, well, thanks again for inviting me to do this. I'm really excited um, to share a little bit of information about biomarkers. And we're gonna start with some that we use all the time and you'll recognize, and then we'll move into the sort of more exciting ones, the novel ones, and then hopefully take a look into the future about what's possible, we hope um, sometime soon. Okay, so I'm gonna start, I'm just gonna share my screen um, and my slides. Okay, great. Um, so um, I'm really excited to be a part of uh, NEFCURE U. Um, I feel like maybe I should get a diploma out of this or something at the end. Um, but today what I'm gonna talk about is improving diagnosis with biomarkers in kidney disease. And so um, I'll just start off here with my disclosures. So like you heard, I do work for the University of Michigan. Um, I do a fair amount of glomerular disease research and my funding sources are listed here, including NEFCURE, thank you. Um, I do um, research with some big consortia that some of you may be familiar with, the Neptune Consortia, CureGN, and the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. And then I have served on some advisory boards for, um, for these three pharmaceutical companies. All right, so this is what I'd like to talk about today. First, um, we're just gonna go over what is a biomarker? What do I mean when I use that term? We're gonna talk about some biomarkers that are available in nephrotic syndrome. There are some that are relevant for all types of kidney disease. And then we have some disease specific biomarkers. And then we'll talk about the future of biomarkers and how I hope they might change the way we practice. Okay, so a very basic definition of a biomarker, and this comes from um, the FDA and NIH. They have this resource called the BEST resource um, where they really give good definitions that everyone should use when they're talking about um, these terms. So a biomarker is something that's measured, um, and it doesn't have to be from the blood or the urine. It can be any type of measurement like blood pressure or measuring something in a kidney biopsy, something like that, but it's something that you actually measure and it's an indicator of either a normal, healthy biological process, it's a measure of something that's gone wrong, it's a measure of being exposed to something or um, taking a new medication, including um, um, various interventions. Okay, so that's the FDA's definition, but I think it's probably more helpful to look at some examples. So there's probably a few different types of biomarkers, and they kind of fall in some of these categories that I've listed here. So for example, a, when I say a diagnostic biomarker, I mean something I'm measuring where I'm gonna confirm the presence of disease. So for example, we measure uh, glucose in the blood or a hemoglobin A1C, and that's a diagnostic biomarker, for example, for steroid-induced um, diabetes. There are monitoring biomarkers. 
So these are things that you measure where, um, where you're assessing the status of the disease, how active it is, or whether you've been exposed to something. So I think a good example is for people that have ever taken tepolimus, often your doctor will monitor levels. And this is to see what your level of exposure to the drug is. So that's a monitoring biomarker. There are response biomarkers. So essentially we wanna say we, we give a medication and we wanna know if it's working or not. So for example, if you have really high cholesterol levels and someone gives you a lipid lowering medication, you can measure cholesterol later to see what's happening. Probably the area of most research is in predictive and prognostic biomarkers. So predictive biomarkers are something that you could measure in someone and for patients with high levels or low levels, they're more or less likely to have either a good response to a drug or have a side effect from a drug. So these biomarkers are really useful when you wanna know what's gonna happen in the future. And for example, there's a blood test we do when we're gonna give a patient azathioprine because we know if they have a certain result, they're at high risk of toxicity from that drug. And lastly, prognostic biomarkers. So these are some things where we could measure and people could have a whole range of level. And that level would help us um, know what's the chance of a future clinical event happening. So for example, if you do a kidney biopsy, they can measure the amount of scarring on the biopsy, either in the filters or the other space of the kidney. And the amount of scarring that's there tells us something about what's the chance that, that over time you're gonna lose kidney function. And so this is something you measure once and it's telling you something about how you might do in the future. So, um, so that's just to say that the word biomarker can have many different jobs and um, the types of studies that we do, they have to be set up with um, kind of that in mind. What are you trying to find a biomarker? What's its job? And you know, is it similar to other biomarkers we currently use? All right, so that's what a biomarker is. Let's talk about um, some we use all the time um, in kidney disease that are relevant really not only in nephrotic syndrome, but many types of kidney disease. And then we'll, I'll tell you one story from a disease specific one as well. Okay, so you know something that's relevant to all kidney disease is how well is the kidney cleaning the blood? And then how healthy are the filters or the glomeruli that make up um, the kidney? So, um, I think probably many of you have seen that the blood test we do to measure how well a kidney is cleaning the blood is creatinine. In kids, a very common similar blood test is cystatin C. You can measure in adults too, but I think just in common practice, I see it more often done in pediatric patients. So these are blood tests. They tell us something about how the kidney is cleaning the blood. The next question is how healthy are the filters? And that um, typically, I'm talking about measuring urine protein or urine albumin because healthy filters really shouldn't be leaking those things into the urine. So these are diagnostic and potentially prognostic biomarkers that tell us do people have kidney disease or not. Okay, so let's start off with creatinine and cystatin C. So why do we measure those? So those markers, creatinine and cystatin C, they're toxins that are produced by the body. We all make them and it's the kidney's job to clean it out. And so we take advantage of that by being able to measure that in the blood, and then we can plug it into a formula and get something called your estimated glomerular filtration rate. And that's just telling me as a whole, how well is the kidney cleaning the blood? What's kind of convenient about that is normal is around 100, 100 to 120 milliliters per minute per meter squared. So normal is around 100%. And as that estimated GFR drops, you, you have less and less kidney function. So this is kind of a nice graphic from the, from the National Kidney Foundation that you know we put these labels of stages of chronic kidney disease, but it's really just based on this estimating equation. So we measure creatinine, we put it in these formulas, out pops an estimate of your GFR. And as that gets lower, that's less and less um, kidney function, lower ability to clean the blood. If you wanna play around with the formula, it's here's the link um, on the NKF um, website. And I will notice there's many formulas you can use, um, but typically there are different formulas for adults and kids. And adolescents, it's actually really tricky to know exactly what to do. So there are formulas that cross that age threshold, and then some people um, like to use an average. So that's estimated GFR and creatinine. I'm sure you've seen that on your lab reports and follow it over time. 
I just want to say uh, just some practical information from my perspective as a nephrologist about using creatinine and an estimated glomerular filtration rate. Number one, those formulas are an estimate. So this is a graph from the paper that derived that formula. And what they did is they measured GFR, where they actually take the person to a lab, they inject a substance, they do a very careful measurement of what the true glomerular filtration rate is. And then they did this, they used their estimating equations. And you can just see if it was perfect, everyone would fall right along this dark black line. You can see there's lots of people where it's an underestimate and lots of people it's an overestimate, especially at normal ranges of kidney function. So just keep that in mind that you can see that number fluctuate a bit um, and it's not, um, you know, it's an estimate. It's useful. I use it all the time in my clinical practice, um, but just keep it in mind that it's not, um, not perfectly accurate. And so that's why I say the trajectory is probably more important than the absolute number. So I like to look at those numbers over time. I graph it in my electronic health record to see what's happening to my GFR over time. The other thing I want you to know is you cannot use those formulas if creatinine levels are changing. So the only reason those formulas are even close to estimating the accurate number is because we all kind of make the same amount of creatinine every day. So if you get really sick or really dehydrated or during a pregnancy or something else where that creatinine levels are fluctuating, then it's not going to be an accurate representation of the GFR. So those are some practical tips about creatinine as a diagnostic biomarker for kidney disease um, to keep in mind when you're using it. All right, how about assessing the health of those filters? So healthy kidneys, they're each made of um, several million glomeruli. Those glomeruli are kind of where the kidney starts out filtering the blood. And if they're healthy, those filters really should not let blood and protein into the urine. And so if I see those things, blood cells and protein in the urine, I know those filters are damaged. So proteinuria, as this means protein in the urine, it's a marker not only of kidney disease with like a diagnostic biomarker, but we think it's probably also prognostic as well. So for example, there's this map here that no matter where your estimated GFR is, if you're spilling more and more and more protein, you're at higher risk that you'll lose kidney function over time. There's a few ways to measure protein in the urine. You can um, uh, send patients home with a jug that can um, essentially for 24 hours put all their urine into the jug and then the lab will tell us how many grams of protein are in that urine. The other alternative is to have people just pee in a single cup. We take the concentration of protein, the concentration of creatinine, and we take a ratio. And that's kind of a rough estimate of that 24 hour collection. Like I said, healthy kidneys really shouldn't have protein in there. So normal is less than 0.3, uh, that should be 0.3 grams per day or 0.3 milligrams per milligram on that ratio. So how about some practical information about proteinuria? So number one, a lot of people use dipsticks, both in the office we use them, people use them at home. Um, but the dipstick um, can really be affected a lot by how concentrated or dilute the urine is. So if you drink two liters of water and pee a really dilute urine, that dipstick can be falsely negative just because it's so dilute. And that's why that protein to creatinine ratio is probably a more useful number because it takes into account how concentrated the urine is. Proteinuria levels can also vary over the course of the day. So that's why you'll often find, especially in kids, they want um, that if you're gonna just pee in a cup once, it's that first morning void. That's the one that's most accurate with the true 24 hour collection. And of course, I think you all may know already that if you have a lot of protein in the urine, people will often notice um, a lot of bubbles or foam in their urine. And when I look at under the microscope, sometimes I can see so much protein in the urine that it makes these little droplets. And when I polarize them, they make these little Maltese crosses. So that's a sign that there's protein in there even without measuring it. Okay, so let's talk about a disease specific biomarker. And the story I wanna tell you about is membranous nephropathy. So many of you may know that nephrotic syndrome patients show up with very similar symptoms. So many patients will show up with swelling in their legs or in their face or in their bellies. 
um, they'll get to see that either their primary doctor gets sent to a nephrologist, they'll find they have protein in the urine. And the kidney biopsy is often um, the way to tell us which underlying cause um, is, is injuring the kidney and causing this nephrotic syndrome. So there are actually many different diseases that can present with the same symptoms. And so membranous nephropathy is one of them, sometimes called membranous glomerulonephropathy. And what this is, is on the kidney biopsy, we can see that the glomerular basement membrane, so the little very first part of our filters, they're really thick. And so this silver stain kind of lights um, lights up the glomerular basement membrane and they're just too thick. There's too much black in this picture. And when they zoom, the pathologists zoom in at really, really high power along that little filtration barrier, what you can see is that the body is depositing these, um, these proteins and these antibodies that are getting stuck in there and sort of gumming up the filter. And that's why the filter is failing. And it's always this way. So these little antigen antibody complexes, they just line the filter and it's always in the same place. And that's the, the, the way to diagnose membranous glomerulonephropathy on a biopsy. Okay, so what's so great about the membranous nephropathy story is that we have made huge progress in understanding the biology. So we've known for decades that that's what's happening in the kidney, that these antigens and antibodies are being deposited in the filters. And what we never knew is what, what protein is the body reacting to? Why is the body attacking the kidney in this way? And so this landmark work done now back in 2009 by a group at um, Boston University, they did a really clever study where they took um, kidney and they sort of spread out all the proteins and they poured on the serum from patients with membranous nephropathy and tried to figure out which protein is the kidney recognizing as foreign. And it's one of these fortuitous science stories that they added a reagent they had never added before. And after years of the experiment not working, this time it worked. And what they found is in these membrane, the patients with membranous nephropathy, they all had this protein that they seemed to be reacting to. Whereas patients with other causes of kidney disease like FSGS, diabetes, really didn't have this protein. And so they um, sent it off to some collaborators and ultimately were able to narrow down by understanding the protein um, signature that what it was is this protein, M-type phospholipase A2 receptor. So people call this PLA2R. And turns out they were able to isolate a antibody from the blood. And this protein is a protein that's always in the kidney. And that's what we think is causing membranous nephropathy in probably 70 to 80% of people. So when they did this test, they measured the blood now of patients with membranous nephropathy and about 70% of them had this. And people who had other causes of membranous nephropathy like lupus or medication effects, things like that, they didn't have it. Other kidney disease and healthy people do not have this antibody. And so what's so great about this is now this is a blood test where we can measure an antibody that most of the time we don't have, just people with membranous nephropathy have it. And so it's a diagnostic biomarker because it tells me you have membranous, you don't have minimal change disease, you don't have lupus, you don't have these other things. So it's a diagnostic biomarker, but we think it's also prognostic. There's a good chunk of patients with membranous nephropathy that actually, if we don't do anything, the disease actually will go away on its own. The body just turns off production of this antibody. And so now we can measure this in the blood and if it's really high and the patients are spilling lots of protein, they're really sick, then we know we should go ahead and treat them. But if it's really low, kidney function's okay, maybe we can just watch people. And we can see if our treatment's working. So if we give a treatment, we can watch PLA2R titers. And if it disappears from the blood, typically the protein follows as well. And this is just a schematic, but they've actually measured it in, in clinical trials and shown exactly that, that PLA2R falls and then proteinuria improves. So this has so many, this like one study has so many downstream effects. 
because now if we understand what the protein is and the, what the body's recognizing as foreign, it really opens up a whole bunch of options for therapies because we understand the mechanism. So I just listed some here that are all under investigation, including a link to Nefker's excellent um, gateway website where you can keep up to date on kind of new trials happening in glomerular disease. And they've learned so much more now. Now that we know what the problem is, we've learned all of these things about that antibody and that protein in the kidney. So that protein lives on a specific cell in the kidney called the podocyte. The body starts to recognize that it's foreign. We actually know across that big protein which part of the protein the body is recognizing as foreign. But there's a lot more work to be done. We still don't understand what triggers it? What is it that, um, that causes the body to recognize this protein at foreign, um, as foreign? We don't really yet know all the things about what this protein, this PLA2R protein is doing in health and disease. And then really we're still work, working out kind of, um, you know, what are the right thresholds to decide when someone needs treatment or if it's working and does, does that affect how long we treat people? But you can see how it's had all of these um, really helpful um, information to taking care of patients with membranes. And not only that, that one study then spur, has spurred many other um, studies. So since they've discovered this technique to be able to uncover it, there have now been other autoantigens that have been discovered. So you remember about 70 to 80% of people have anti-PLA2R, but there's a remaining people that their biopsy looks exactly like that, but they have something else. And so there's been a ton of work, actually a lot of it out of the Mayo Clinic, where they have taken out their tissues from the archive and they've um, been able to identify other autoantigens. And I've just listed some of them here, thrombosfondin, NEL, exostosin, and so you see we're starting to fill in the gap. So I think this, I love this story because you know, the scientific advance of understanding the biology allowed us better diagnostic biomarkers, prognostic biomarkers, and led us to really novel clinical trials and new therapeutic development. Okay, so let's take a look at the future, kind of what I hope at, the, um, at some point we'll see. So um, I tell this story a lot. Um, this is when I was in training, um, about now 10 years ago at the University of Pennsylvania, I took care of two patients with FSGS. Patient A is a young man, 26, born in the Philippines, completely healthy. And around age 20, he shows up with swelling in his ankles. And when I met him, his kidney function was fine. We initially tried steroids, the disease relapsed. When we stopped, we put him on tacrolimus and the disease went into remission. And every time we tried to stop the medication, his disease would come back, but we'd restart the medication, it would go right into remission. My other patient, similarly, 26 year old woman, African-American, she also was completely healthy. She'd been born prematurely, but otherwise had no medical problems. She, um, when she finally got diagnosed, already her kidney function was quite reduced. We tried several medications, none of which seemed to work. By the time I left my training, she was starting peritoneal dialysis. But their biopsy both essentially showed the same thing, which is FSGS. So what that means is part of some of her, their glomeruli had a scar. So this pattern of injury, although it looked very similar on the biopsy, obviously these patients have two very different experiences. And so I think um, this truthfully, the, these two patients are sort of why I fell in love with taking care of patients with nephrotic syndrome and FSGS in particular, because I want to solve this problem. All right, so how do we tackle something like this? Um, to me, what we need are better biomarkers. So what we need is to know, okay, we have this group of people that have FSGS, there are clearly subtypes. And how can we learn from the patients who have this condition? How can we learn to better under, understand those different subgroups? And what could we measure either in the blood or the urine or the kidney tissue that might give us better information about how they're gonna do over time and what therapies are best? So that's the idea of precision medicine, that we can identify um, subgroups and match them better to therapies. 
All right, so I'm going to tell you about the Neptune study. So for those of you who don't know, Neptune is a study that's been going on now for about, uh, I think, about 10 years. And so what Neptune decided to do was to approach patients who were newly diagnosed with protein in their urine and that their doctor had already decided they were getting a kidney biopsy. So we asked these people if they would be willing to join the Neptune study. And at the time of biopsy, they not only give us blood samples and urine samples, but they give us a little piece of kidney tissue. And the idea was that we could take all of that and better understand um, relevant subgroups. So we asked these patients not only to um, during the study and at the time of biopsy, but then we followed them over time um, to see sort of what happens to their kidneys over time and how they respond to um, therapy. And I have to say, I'm just amazed at the generosity of patients who participate in this study because most of them, you know, it's a new disease. They're obviously about to go under an invasive procedure and to be altruistic enough to participate. Obviously, it's a huge gift. Um, to the nephrology community and hopefully to future patients with uh, nephrotic syndrome. All right, so the idea of Neptune was that the patients who participate, they give us, um, they tell us all about themselves, their history, their past medical history. We follow them over time to see what happens to their kidneys. But then we take those, those samples that they've given us and we generate all of these different data types proteins from the urine, metabolites from the urine, and from the kidney tissue, we do something called gene expression analysis, where we can take that tissue and we can see within that person which genes are turned on and turned off. So the story I'm gonna tell you now starts at that particular data set. So what we did is we took patients with either FSGS or minimal change disease, and we took their kidney tissue gene expression and we did a clustering algorithm. So we did this in Neptune, but there are two other sister cohorts. ERCB is a European cohort and H3 Africa is an African cohort. And we extracted from the kidney tissue the gene expression and we tried to say um, which patients seem to group together. So instead of just two groups, actually in all three of these cohorts, we actually found three groups. And you can see that they don't perfectly align with FSGS and minimal change. So in our new, I'll call them just molecular subgroups, we have three of them, one, two, three. Each one of them contains patients who, if you, all you did was look at their biopsy, you would say FSGS or minimal change disease. You can see kind of the overlap here. Then we looked, well, what, what happens to those patients over time? And turns out patients that are in subgroup three, they seem to have a worse course over time. They're more likely to lose their kidney function. They're a little bit less likely to achieve remission of their disease. So we can go back to the gene expression data and say, okay, what's going on in cluster three? What genes are turned on or turned off in that group that are different from the other groups? And so we line all those genes up like gene A and gene B. And by the pattern in those genes, we can not only say this gene's different, this gene's different, but we can say, I think this gene that's above is probably controlling that. And what we found is that a big portion of the genes that were different in cluster three versus the other two, we could link them all back to this drug, um, to this molecule, tumor necrosis factor, or TNF. So there are many genes that are different between those groups, but about 30 to, five, 30 to 35% of the genes, we could tie back to this one pathway. Okay, so we take that information, we say, okay, it looks like a lot of what's different about what's going on in the kidney can be linked to TNF. We wanna quantify that for an individual patient. So we can make a score. So we can essentially average the genes and um, put them all together and say, okay, for this person, their average TNF score is really high. Whereas this person all the way down here, their TNF score is really low. And you can see that for all the patients that were in subgroup three, a lot of them had high TNF alpha scores. The bars are positive. Whereas the people in, in the other clusters, one and two, those are blue and green. You can see they're all kind of mixed together. So TNF is not what's separating those other two groups. TNF is really what's doing, making the difference for, um, for that cluster three. And turns out um, we did the same thing in our other cohorts. We found the the same pattern. So 
um, it's always a good step for biomarkers. If you're looking for them, you want to um, have one group of people that you kind of do all that discovery work. And you want to make sure that if you take it to another population, it will still work. So that's why we're looking at the same information in these other cohorts. Okay, so we think we have essentially a group of patients where TNF-alpha is active, and, um, but we don't want to do a kidney biopsy every time. Um, that's invasive, there's risk to it, um, and so what we really want is some, a biomarker we can measure either in the blood or the urine that will tell us what's going on in the kidney. So in Neptune, you remember we have all those different data sets. So we can look in our protein data set and say, okay, are there any proteins in the urine that look like they're moving in the same direction as our TNF alpha score. And turns out there were quite a few, but two of them looked pretty good. So if we measure these two proteins in the urine, MCP1 and TIMP1, it correlates pretty well with the expression of that gene in the kidney and also tells us something about what the TNF activation is. So people that have a lot of this protein in their urine, they seem to have higher TNF alpha scores and people who had low levels of this protein had less TNF alpha scores. So if we think into the future, what would be amazing is we could measure these biomarkers, urinary MCP1 and TIMP1. We could put them into a calculator and calculate a predicted TNF alpha score without doing a kidney biopsy. And then we can compare that to a reference population like the Neptune population and say, okay, we have a new patient. Here's their urine MCP1 and TIMP1 levels. Let's go ahead and calculate their score. It looks like they would fall in this group of patients where someone else who maybe had a low, rec, um, a low score um, would be more like these patients over here. Okay, so why is, why is this so appealing? So right now for FSGS in particular, but truthfully for a lot of glomerular diseases, we have stories that are similar to my two patients where our current diagnostic biomarkers are grouping together people that have some things in common, but there's clearly subgroups within them. And what we do is we take those really heterogeneous groups and we enroll them in clinical trials with a new medication. The problem is that medication may not work in everyone. And so the trial may not be successful. Just like you've experienced probably with medications you've tried. Sometimes you've tried things and they just don't work. We just wanna get better beforehand of knowing, do we think that that medication might work? So for example, if you knew there was a subpopulation that was more likely to respond to a medication, maybe you could use a biomarker to identify that group. Not to say for sure, but to say, we think there's a higher chance that you'll respond to that medicine. And then you can do the clinical trial and say, okay, we're gonna hope that we get more patients with this. and Maybe we're more likely to get a successful clinical trial and get smarter about who are the right patients to be treated with that particular medication. So that's my dream, not only for clinical trial design, but hopefully for the future. And the reason people I think are interested in this TNF story in particular is that TNF has been tried in FSGS. So there are good animal models that show that pathway might be relevant in kidney disease and they moved it to a clinical trial. And this is, the, um, this is just the grid of the patients that participated in this phase one trial. And these were patients that had very resistant FSGS. They'd had many different treatments. The disease was not well controlled. And this trial actually in the end was not successful, probably because it had very heterogeneous um, inclusion. But look at these two patients here. So this patient, patient number eight, when they came into the study, they were spilling 17 grams of protein. When they got TNF alpha blockade, their protein went to 0.6. And similarly, here's someone else who's spilling 3.6 grams. They went down to 0.6. So you can see that many of these patients, the drug didn't work. There's a couple that it did. And so you can see how a biomarker might be helpful to sort of improve our odds that we're picking the right all right, so this kind of really exciting biomarker work using a lot of different data domains is going on in a lot of cohorts. So I told you about Neptune and ERCB, there's C-probe, um, there are big diabetes cohorts, including the Pima Indian cohort. H3 Africa has not only glomerular disease, but many other types of kidney disease. CureGN is recruiting about 2,400 patients um, with minimal change 
exchange FSGS membranous nephropathy and IgA nephropathy, and KPMP is studying both acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. And there are many more. This is just, I ran out of room on this slide. But I think this type of work where we actually start with people and human samples and can crosswalk between blood samples, urine samples, tissue samples, that's where we can really start to identify novel biomarkers for um, diagnosis, for prognosis, and for um, response to therapy. All right, so I will um, just, I, I work in a big group that all that work that I showed from the Neptune study in particular um, involves a lot of people, including our really excellent study coordinators. Um, and of course the patients who um, participate in that study. Um, and then I have funding from the NIH to, um, to do that work and, and work with them. All right, so I will end there um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, that was great. Um, yeah, we do. We have a couple of questions. Um, if you are with us and you have a question for Dr. Mariani, please go ahead and put that into the Q&A. Um, the first one is, what's the difference between proteinuria and albuminuria um, regarding biomarker? Yeah. So proteinuria measures all of the proteins in the urine. And so, um, when a kidney filter is really damaged, like the glomerulus, lots of proteins get through. Albumin is only one type of protein. So albumin is the most dominant protein we have in our blood. Um, and so um, it's the most dominant protein we have in our blood. So that's the, if you measure urine protein, most of what's there will be albumin. So what you'll see, if you measured both at the same time, the urine protein, you'd probably have a little more, urine albumin would have a little bit less. Sometimes people like to measure urine albumin. I, I think would say it's a practice difference. There, you'll see certain sites, um, they always measure urine albumin. Other sites always measure urine protein. For glomerular disease and nephrotic syndrome, it probably doesn't matter that much because they are so correlated. But for other kidney diseases, it's actually pretty important. So you can have um, other kidney diseases where the protein that's getting in is not albumin. So for example, there are cancers that do that tubular disorders, there's different proteins that get into the urine. So there are other types of kidney disease where it probably makes a difference if you're measuring albumin or something else. Um, for FSGS, membrane property, minimal change disease, they typically kind of go together. Thank you. Um, another one uh, from Kevin, he is asking, uh, going back to the beginning of your talk, what's the role of C, statin C um, patients with glomerular disease? Yeah, so the statin C. So creatinine, um, you know, we take advantage of the fact that everyone makes it. So it's a byproduct of muscle metabolism. And so that's one of the first markers that they use to kind of assess kidney function. But it has some caveats. So for example, um, if people have, um, I don't know, maybe on the extremes of muscle mass. So if you have, um, I don't know, if we used creatinine, but maybe in everyone that was participating in like weightlifting at the Olympics, um, it probably wouldn't be a very good marker because those people have way more muscle mass than the average human population. And so, um, so the marker in terms of how well it reflects kidney function does kind of depend on how much muscle mass you have. And so that's a limitation. There are some other limitations. So for example, if people are really sick, people are in the hospital, their muscles make less creatinine. And so then it's less reliable as a marker. Um, so cystatin C, I use it in that situation and people that are, um, extremes of muscle mass, or if I think their creatinine is changing for some reason, um, then I'll go ahead and double check with a cystatin C, but it's used the same way. You can put it in a formula, you can get estimated GFR. Um, the pediatric formulas for estimating GFR, there's a lot more of them that, um, do rely on cystatin C. So in the pediatric population, it can be really helpful to get a better estimate of the GFR. Thank you. Doris is asking for FSGS, what is more important to look at? Urine, protein, creatinine ratio, or a serum albumin? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, so for FSGS and actually other nephrotic syndromes as well, you can imagine that as you, as you pee out protein, um, most of which is albumin, the albumin level in your blood tends to drop. And so they often go together. 
Um, so if you're spilling more protein, the albumin level in the blood will drop. Um, I do like to look at both of them. So I, it's, I, I don't think I could pick a favorite, <laughs> um, but so I think both are important, but you're right. I often find that, um, that the albumin, um, it'll sometimes in some patient, patients, it'll tell us more about how bad their swelling is, that how much their risk is for other complications like clotting, things like that. So I think it tend, the albumin in the blood tends to track a little bit more with symptoms. There are people, for example, patients with diabetes, some of them have tons of protein in the urine, but they don't have swelling and their albumin is fine. And biologically, I don't know why that is. Why can some patients hang on to their albumin and others can't? I don't think we know the answer to that. That would be a good research question to answer someday that would too. Be, yeah. I, think, I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there. Yes. Um, Ed has a great question. Um, are the tests or the biomarkers, biomarker tests different for native kidneys versus transplant kidneys? Mm, great question. So for, um, for creatinine, uh, well, I, I get, maybe you can let me know if you're thinking for GFR estimating, but for creatinine, uh, we do use the same formulas for transplant patients and native kidney, but you're right. The formulas, um, you know, they, they were, they were built in a very mixed population. And so taking those formulas and applying them to everyone of all causes of kidney disease, transplant, everything, you're right, the accuracy probably goes down. Um, so it's probably not as accurate in transplant patients. Also, transplant patients are often on medications called like tecrolimus or cyclosporin. Those drugs um, tend to make the creatinine levels fluctuate a lot more. And so just, and it's not because their kidney function has changed. It's just an effect of the drug. And so if those levels are bouncing, you remember I said that the formulas aren't really accurate unless that creatinine is rock steady. It also makes it a little bit less, um, a little less accurate just because of that fluctuation. So, so if you were to, let's go around the same question. If you were to talk about the, like the TNF and those two specific urine protein marker biomarkers, do any of those biomarkers change because of a, because the person has a transplanted kidney or is that process you know is does it stay the same i guess yeah it's outside a great of outside of looking at gfr yeah yeah so um so that all that work we did around trying to identify subgroups and biomarkers in fsgs patients all that work was done in patients with um native kidney disease there's nothing to say that pipeline, there's nothing to say we couldn't apply that pipeline to transplant patients. My guess is that the markers would be different. Mm -hmm. um, um, especially because we know some of those markers, you know, the medications that transplant patients on are different and likely affect mm -hmm. those markers and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's nothing to say that, that essentially that pipeline, taking gene expression, trying to find a group that share a signature, to find markers in the urine that reflect that, that totally could be done in transplant patients. We would just need a similar um, resource to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, another one from Kevin. The example of membranous nephropathy, nephropathy was a great example of research discovery leading to a pharmaceutical investment, right? Mm -hmm. um, perfect example. Uh, are there other kidney diseases that would benefit from similar collaboration? Yes. So I love the membranous story because over my career, what I want to see happen is that story repeated for IgA nephropathy for minimal change disease for FSGS. Yes. And that's really the whole point of like, of Neptune, uh, of CureGN, of Trident, all these great studies where patients have partnered with their centers to help contribute um, samples where we can do that kind of work. And, you know, I, I think what I love about the membranous story is, you know, there'd been all this work that had been done in mice. We had great mouse models for membranous nephropathy, and it just, for whatever reason, didn't translate totally to humans. And it was the human samples that really made the difference um, mm -hmm. where they were able to make this discovery. It turns out humans are not mice. Um, we're not. So even though uh, genetically there's a lot in common, you should ask Ali Garavi at the next one how much we have in common with mice. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Um, but, um, but that's what I love about that story. Um, and there is work that's being done for sure. So I would say, um, 
there's been a lot of promising work in IgA nephropathy, kind of understanding similarly, we see these antibodies that are depositing in the kidney, how do they get there and why? And there's been a ton of work understanding kind of where those originate from, what happens to them such that they lodge in the kidney. And so I think, um, I think this is a really exciting time for nephrology because the technology and the tools have kind of caught up with, um, with kind of the sample availability and whatnot to allow us to do some of this discovery work. Um, I have uh, some questions for you. So, um, so I'm really intrigued about the information that you provided on TNF activation and those two specific pr urine proteins. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, are, is, this a, is this an ongoing study at your site? Is this a site specific study? And if someone's in your area, is there, is there an opportunity for them to get involved or can you tell us more about yeah. that? Yep. So there actually is a proof of concept clinical trial going on. It's at three different centers. So Michigan's enrolling NYU and there's one more and I can't remember. Um, but um, but yes, yeah, so the idea is this is a hypothesis, right? We did all of this work on a other research study. We have this hypothesis that we can find people not that are we know are going to respond to TNF, but might have a higher chance. And so um, th there is a trial that's going on right now where we measure those two biomarkers in patients. If they have high levels, they're offered a TNF alpha blocker, and then we see what happens to them. So it's a small proof of concept trial. They're trying to get about, I think, 10 patients to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's successful, then we could do a bigger trial. And so is, is there a website or something that they could, um, or maybe you could provide me uh, some yeah. information to send out. Um, if yep. there's anyone that's interested, we could do that for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I, I find it really interesting. I, I, you know, I'm a patient parent and, uh, I have to say when my son was put on a TNF, you know, medication, um, he, he hasn't spilled protein since. So I have to wow. say, yeah. Um, Good. I'm wondering if one of those two urine proteins were his, uh, were his markers, but you know, I don't, we don't know that, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. quite interesting. So I'd love yeah. to I'd love to hear more about that in the future. Yeah, because um, I think right now your experience is probably like a lot of people that we often have this menu that we just kind of work through and say, I hope this one works. If it doesn't, we'll try this one and that one. And that's just not a great way to practice medicine, right? We really want to say, okay, for you, I think this is where we should start. And for you, this is where we should start. And so that's, that's what we're trying to get to. I know. I love the quote that you said a while ago that we want to get better at knowing if a medicine will work for you. Instead of that cocktail and let's just try this or try this. And that's, that's the importance around clinical trials right now, to be honest with you, right? We mm -hmm. have a lot in the pipeline. We have a lot out there that could really potentially have a huge difference because there's a lot of really good science that backs it up. So um, another question for you, How, this is kind of a, a, a professional question for you. I'm, I'm curious. So this webinar series is all around precision medicine. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how the advances in understanding these molecular concepts and the molecular basis of, of kidney disease has, has affected the way that you help your patients or how you manage your patient care. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So for, um, you know, for, for membranous nephropathy, that story that's further along, I would say that has dramatically changed the way that I take care of patients. Right, so so now I I, just, I can't imagine managing a membranous patient without monitoring their PLA2R levels over time, and explaining it to patients and following it, um, and so that you know so I think you know that's the model that we really want for all of these other nephrotic syndrome conditions. Um, the other is the importance of you know obviously I'm completely biased that I work at a major academic center that believes in these research, yeah. so um, so I really for patients that have rare disease, I offer them a, a range of ways to participate in research. And it doesn't have to be as invasive as nephrotic. There's so many other things that people can do to give us more information. And that's really the limiting thing that these are rare diseases. And so to get enough people to learn, you have rare diseases with subtypes. <laughs> so so mm -hmm. even if we got everyone with FSGS, that was probably a hundred diseases. Um, so getting, um, you know, so, sort of helping people sort of find where they can contribute, um, I think it's really the most important thing. Um, but yes, I'm hoping that the way I practice glomerular disease today will be drastically different 10 years later. 
Yeah. And so this might be like, you know, such an obvious question, but I just have to ask, um, you know, how do you envision precision medicine? Um, how do you think it will impact kidney disease patients? Like what's the, what's the meaning behind it? Why should people understand what precision medicine is? Yeah. So I think probably most people are familiar with the fact that, um, you know, if you, if you get diagnosed with breast cancer in this country, they don't just say you have breast cancer, right? They have a whole panel of genes, blood tests, um, stainings they do on the tissue to better understand what subtype. And based on that, they make much better um, assignments of kind of therapy. And so to me, um, that, that is the same goal that we have for nephrotic syndrome, that when people get diagnosed in the future, they will have a series of tests. I think they'll have genetic tests. I think that they'll have um, special stains done on their kidney. I think that they'll have biomarkers measured in their blood and their urine. And out of that, we'll be able to better match people to therapy and hopefully save them all the toxicity for ones that don't work. Um, and I think that's totally doable. I don't think that's like a, like, you know, a hundred years from now, we'll see that. I think that really will happen. Um, I think um, your next talk, Ali Garavi, will show you even some of the phenomenal advances we've made in understanding genetics. There are some subgroups that we really have understood and, and really are now novel therapies are being developed because we understand the genetic cause. So that's another place I think that precision medicine is really um, happening for these diseases. Yeah, can make a big difference um, mm -hmm. in treatment options, obviously moving forward. So um, to kind of conclude, I wanted to mention there were a few um, like these cohort studies that you were talking about. Um, if you are interested in Neptune or CureGN, these are two of these long longitudinal kind of observational type of studies that NEFCURE um, provides a lot of funding. We believe in the science and the investigators behind it. If you're interested in getting involved in one of those, it is not an interventional trial. What's the difference? An interventional trial is are those that you may take um, a study drug or um, a medication or a, you know that sort of thing. Observational is that you they would like have access to you as far as like certain lab tests. They might be able to access your medical records through your doctor, that sort of thing. So they can build kind of a registry and use some of that data for some of these research studies that they, that they, um, that they do. Um, you can go to kidneyhealthgateway.com. Uh, we do have observational studies listed and Neptune and CureGN are, are some of them. Um, they, are, they are both recruiting um, across our country. It depends on the site and um, you know, what they are accepting at that particular time. But you know, an inquiry is uh, basically just saying, if you say I'm interested, it's basically just saying you'd like to talk to someone at the site and get more information and see if it's something that you would like to do. So if you're interested in that, I would tell you to go to kidneyhealthgateway.com. And then finally, because there was a lot of really great information today on membranous nephropathy, if anyone here that's listening now or maybe in the future has membranous nephropathy, I want you to know that we're having an externally led patient focused drug development meeting um, for membranous nephropathy patients on August 27th. It is completely virtual. Um, so if you're interested in this particular meeting, it is a patient focused meeting. The FDA is present. They listen to patient stories. They listen to what is important to you as far as treatment options, patient outcomes, what's more important to you around like symptoms um, and the types of drugs that you'd be willing to take and that sort of thing. So it's really geared around clinical trials and, and knowing what your preference is. And it's really important. The FDA has um, made a big change over, I would say, the last five years. And they said, you know what? We would rather hear from the patients than we would rather hear from anybody else. So this is your chance. If you're a membranous nephropathy patient, we'd love to have you. You can go to nefcure.org and register, or you can go to kidney.org because we do this collaboratively with the Nationally Kidney, National Kidney Foundation. So that's my plug there. Um, Dr. Mariani, thank you so much for being here. This was really um, enlightening um, and we just appreciate your time. Great, thanks so much for having me and thanks for the great questions. Yeah, absolutely. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I hope you uh, join me on September 30th for our last in the precision medicine series with Dr. Garavi. 
Go to nefcure.org to learn more about it. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.